actually uh let me erase partially um, so it's completely different to set up what won't really change is that um is that, that will be considering conservation loss strategy so um, so that part won't change so let me leave uh, that part alone and maybe uh, leave alone some of the um, merry-go-round stuff uh, you know i can redraw it it's really just the writing the stuff that uh, takes time and i wouldn't want to write it all again um, okay i think uh, that's it okay so this is a slightly different question than what we looked at before i do believe the conservation law strategy will still apply so i've left this up so that uh, i don't have to write everything again um so it says three children are riding on the edge of a merry-go-round okay let me draw merry-go-round that is of some mass capital m and has some radius okay and it says it's a spinning at some uh, RPM. I, I don't like that unit, but this is, um, so RPM, what it means is revolutions per minute. It's a highly known SI unit, but you know, it looks like they are asking for answer in RPM. So I think if I do a little bit of work with the algebra, then I can avoid having to work, do unit convergence between RPM and other more sensible units. Okay, but we are given the frequency of the merry-go-round initially. Let's call this F naught. The children have masses. Okay, we are given three masses. So let's say here are our children of mass one, mass two, and mass three at the edges. Um, if the child who has a mass, okay, M2, were to move to the center of the merry-go-round, uh, what is the new angular velocity in RPM? Uh, that's interesting. So as I was saying with the other question, the very first thing you should consider, in fact, uh, almost any question you see in physics and engineering, um, I want you to first think, uh, could I use conservation law in this setting? The answer won't always be yes, but again, what I like about first applying conservation law strategy is that in the cases where the answer is no you usually quickly figure out that answer is no <laughs> so you don't waste a lot of time with a method that might never work so here um so i think uh uh, uh it's a really interesting setting uh, i think i can make an easy argument that linear momentum is not going to be conserved in fact, even as this thing is rotating, linear momentum simply isn't conserved because you can see that when the children are down here, linear momentum kind of goes that way. And the, when the children are up here, the linear momentum goes this way. So like even without a child moving, linear momentum just uh, was never being conserved as long as the whole thing isn't being uniformly distributed. So I think I can cross this out quickly and the reason it's not being conserved is because at the pivot point that holds the merry-go-round in place there's going to be forced to just keep it in place and that's an external force now let me tell you something so i have from my physical intuition i know that the answer here will be larger than the number here like without doing any calculation i know that that's what the intuition is and i also know uh, that as this process happens, the total energy of the system will be going up. That's kind of associated with this speed increasing. Um, and that's a, sometimes it's hard to see, like how, uh, where is that energy coming from? And I guess the easiest thing to, uh, is, um, I think the clearest way to kind of get to that is imagine being this child. Imagine. of that merry-go-round as you're doing that uh, in your mind <laughs> there should you should feel some sort of resistance you should feel like you are being pulled outward and you are taking your steps against that and if you are able to successfully imagine that 
then I think you can um, imagine that as the child is walking towards the center of the merry-go-round, they are doing work. Uh, if uh, there wasn't some energy coming from them, you know, from food they ate, then they couldn't do that. So there was an energy input to the system as the child goes to the center. So I'm going to scratch out conservation of mechanical energy because in this setting, mechanical energy isn't conserved. There's the chemical energy within the child that's uh, been turned into mechanical energy. Now, if you don't have this conviction and physical intuition that I have, here's another way you can approach it. So I think we can still say that our angular momentum is conserved because um, the system is, there's no external force uh, other than whatever force might be at the pivot point. And we can see, as with other question, that lever arm for the force, uh, so lever arm for the pivot force is still zero. So there is no torque being applied on the system as long as we are calculating torque about this center of rotation. So we can convince ourselves relatively easily that yes, angular momentum is conserved. And again, if you are not convinced as easily as I am that mechanical energy is not conserved here, you can just leave the question unanswered. Um, you don't, because when you say something isn't conserved, you're not really making an affirmative statement that those, that quantity is violated. You are simply not using a statement saying that it's conserved. So we can start out with the conservation of angular momentum, see if that gives us enough information um, to answer the question. And if it does, we never had to say anything about energy conservation. Uh, it may be conserved, it might not be conserved, and it doesn't matter because we never referenced it in our problem solving. So let me use, uh, let me start out with the conservation of angular momentum. So we are saying the total angular momentum initial is equal to the total angular momentum final. We're just making the statement. We feel there's no outside torque, so the angular momentum should be conserved in this setting. Okay, let's uh, write out what the total initial angular momentum is. So um, I feel like it's gonna be easier if I write it down this way. I'll write down the total rotational inertia times the initial angular velocity. Uh, again, this is coming from the analogy where you know the momentum, linear momentum is mass times velocity. So the angular momentum, rotational version of momentum, is the rotational version of mass times rotational version of velocity. So, and I'll break this out into smaller pieces in a bit. Oh, let me say I total initial. That should equal I total final. Because I think that's a one way to express what's happening. As the child number two goes to the center, the rotational inertia of the whole thing will be changing. And with the changing rotational inertia, there must be matching change in angular velocity so that total angular momentum is conserved, uh, as we think it should be. So let's write it out. So for our strategy for writing down the total rotational inertia is simple. I just uh, look at all the parts that make up the whole system, the merry-go-round, each of the child, and just write it in. So the merry-go-round has rotational inertia of one half its mass times uh, radius squared. That's rotational inertia of a solid uniform disk about its center of mass. Plus um, the, I guess with the children, let me write it this way. They are all at distance r, so I can add up their masses, m1 plus m2 plus m3 times r squared. That's going to be total rotational inertia of the whole thing. And let me do this substitution now so that our math is a little bit easier. The angular velocity can be written in terms of frequency, 2 pi times frequency. So our initial angular velocity will say that uh, 2 pi times initial angular frequency. And I can just use this as the frequency in frequency unit. So we say that all of the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. The total final rotational inertia. I have one half mr squared. The merry-go-round didn't change, and I add double the masses again. Now, one 
thing, one uh, observation will make the expression relatively simple. So I have masses 1 and 3 still at the edge. So I still say m1 plus m3 times r squared. And if I want, I could write this separately. That would be m2 times its distance, uh, which is 0, 0 squared. So, you know, I, I don't even have to write it. I, let me just erase it. So <laughs> it's going to be zero. So let me just not have it. It says, though, one of the masses went away, and now there's only two of the three masses on the edge. And the one at the center doesn't contribute to the rotation inertia. That times 2 pi times, uh, I'm just doing the substitution for this life, 2 pi times the final frequency. All right, I see some things that cancel out. Let me do that. It's the whole reason I wrote it this way. And I think the rest of the calculation, I can just uh, do it on Sage Math. So I'm going to have Sage Math solve for this quantity, which is the only quantity we don't know. So, um, so yeah, I think I declared, I declared all the variables before, except for the individual masses, M1, M2, M3. I think all the other variables were declared before. Um, did I declare F0? Let me just do that just in case. I'm pretty sure, you know, let me just do it in case. All right, so let's write out the equation. Our equation is one half times mass of the miracle round times r squared plus sum of the masses times r squared. Oh, all of that parenthesis times uh, f naught is equal to, uh, let me copy and paste and we use a lot of this typing. Yeah. So M2 is now gone, and uh, instead of F0, it's F final. Okay, I can solve equation one for FF. Uh, one equation, one unknown, should be able to do it. That yeah, looks reasonable. So let me put that into my solution variable, and just uh, uh, it's in a list, so just getting the first element. All right, let's do all the substitutions and see. Now, uh, the reason working directly the frequency is useful is that as long as I keep F0 in the unit that is given, revolutions per minute, the final unit I get will be in revolutions per minute. So I don't have to do any conversion. So I'm just going to substitute in the values. Mass of the merry-go-round, um, initial frequency uh, in the unit I want, 16 RPM. Um, M1, which is 22, uh, I need to put in some, I want to make sure it does decimal approximation. M2 is 28, M3 is 33. Okay, I think that's everything, let's see. Yep, the final RPM is 19.73 RPM, higher, no, 19.73. So that makes intuitive sense to me. Uh, from my intuition, <laughs> guessing that it was going to be higher, yeah. So, so yeah, that's the, um, again, like with the other question, the hardest step is uh, recognizing what's conserved. And once you recognize that angular momentum is conserved and other quantities may not be, then it's a relatively easy math to go through. Uh, I guess the second hardest thing might be just the knowing different the forms for rotation inertia. But uh, if you are stuck there, Look up the textbook. The textbook has a table of rotation inertias, uh, which is basically all the shapes that we are going to deal with.